important. So it's equally obvious that terrorism as such is not viewed by Marxist-Leninists as a mechanism for the seizure of power. To the professional revolutionary, terrorism is but one tactic out of many in a larger strategy of total war. Its primary value lies not in the killing or the destruction, but in the psychological impact upon the population. In fact, it can be stated as a general law of terrorism that its objective is to weaken a target government not by confronting its military force, but by causing its civilian population to react in ways that will undermine the nation. In other words, the action is in the reaction. A nation's economy is a delicate balance of forces, and it responds almost instantaneously to bad news. When people have doubts about the future, they become cautious in their spending. It doesn't take many acts of terrorism before the population begins avoiding unnecessary travel and staying away from public places, the shops and the restaurants. Sales fall off and profits decline. Investors move their savings out of the country to more politically stable areas. Goods become scarce and unemployment rises. Food shortages become a way of life. As the economy is weakened, the government is weakened. And this is brought about not by the direct action of terrorists, but by the reaction of the people. Thus, it is one of the calculated objectives of terrorism. In Italy, when one of the leaders of the Red Brigades was captured and scheduled for trial in 1976, the group demanded his release, and to punctuate that demand, shot down the attorney general, along with his bodyguard and his driver. The trial was postponed. Ten months later, the terrorists assassinated the president of the Turin Law Society, and issued threats to anyone participating in the pending trial. 42 potential jurors asked to be excused for medical reasons, and the trial was postponed again. The terrorists had proven that they could successfully challenge an established government and stop its legal machinery from turning. In Ireland, the spectacle of a few hundred armed revolutionaries pitted successfully against 16,000 British troops makes a similar impression on world opinion. These events communicate a powerful message to the citizens of each target government. The message is that their leaders are weak and politically impotent. It implies also that the revolutionary movement is strong and that it has a real chance of ultimately succeeding. The prestige of the government is damaged in the eyes of its own citizens, while the prestige of the revolutionaries is strengthened, an important factor for the attracting of new recruits and obtaining support from the population. The development of new and powerful weapons gives more advantage to the terrorist than to the state. Since the objective of the terrorist is to create destruction, he is free to use them. The more powerful, the better. But since the objective of the government is to prevent destruction, it cannot safely use these weapons within crowds of its own citizens. In Ireland, for example, British soldiers on occasion have been required to use rubber bullets and their rifles have been reworked to fire single shots only, not the automatic rapid fire bursts for which they were designed. Needless to say, the IRA has no such restrictions. In September of 1973, the Italian police raided an apartment near the Rome airport and found members of a Palestinian terrorist group with two Russian handheld anti-aircraft missiles, the SAM-7, with infrared heat-seeking guidance systems. We have come to the point where one person now can shoot down a $20 million aircraft with hundreds of people on board. And the day of nuclear terrorism may not be far away. It's no wonder, then, that a government which is well prepared to fight a full-scale war on foreign soil can become seemingly helpless and impotent when fighting within its own borders. Eventually, however, with enough humiliation and provocation, almost any government can be goaded into taking more vigorous action to restore its prestige. And that leads to the next part of the story. All Marxist-Leninists are familiar with a small book called the Mini Manual for Urban Guerrillas, written by Carlos Marighella, a former leader of the Communist Party of Brazil. The mini-manual gives complete instructions on every aspect of weaponry, deployment of forces, and the use of terrorism. And then it says, The government has no alternative except to intensify repression 
The police roundups, house searches, arrests of innocent people make life in the city unbearable. The general sentiment is that the government is unjust, incapable of solving problems, and resorts purely and simply to the physical liquidation of its opponents. The urban guerrilla must become more aggressive and violent, resorting without let-up to sabotage, terrorism, expropriations, assaults, kidnappings, and executions, heightening the disastrous situation in which the government must act. This same strategy was expressed in 1968 by Italian communist Gian Giacomo Feltrinelli, famous millionaire publisher of the novel Dr. Zhivago. In a booklet entitled Political Guerrilla Warfare, Feltrinelli said that the task of the terrorist was, and these are his words, to violate the law openly, challenging and outraging institutions and public order in every way. Then when the state intervenes as a result with police and the courts, it will be easy to denounce its harshness and repressive dictatorial tendencies. In Germany, Ulrike Meinhof of the Red Army Fraction explained it this way. She said, It is necessary to provoke the latent fascism in society, and then the people will turn to us for leadership. In 1970, Kent State had become the object of an intensive organizational drive on behalf of the Weatherman Faction of the SDS. For over two years, a steady stream of professional revolutionaries appeared before student groups. Weatherman Bernadine Dorn told them that there soon would be shooting on campus and admonished them to arm themselves for rebellion. Another speaker was Jerry Rubin, who said, The first part of the Yippie program is to kill your parents, and I mean that quite literally because until you're prepared to kill your parents, you're not ready to change this country. The SDS on campus had distributed copies of what it called the Organizer's Manual for the Spring Offensive. The manual said, Beginning with guerrilla theater actions in dorms, we can escalate to disrupting classes, street marches, quick assaults on buildings, before moving to the major confrontation of the struggle. In an SDS pamphlet distributed among students in April of 1969, we find this blunt statement of intent. We're no longer asking you to come and help us make a revolution. We're telling you that the revolution has begun, and the only choice you have to make is which side you're on. The revolution at Kent State began in earnest on May 1st, 1970. The date itself is significant. May Day is the international communist holiday. A student demonstration was called to protest military action in Southeast Asia, and this was the beginning of four days of violence. Unruly crowds surged through the streets, breaking windows and setting fires. On campus, the ROTC building was burned to the ground. Firemen were struck by rocks from the crowd, and their fire hoses were cut. When the National Guard was called in to restore order and protect property, they became the immediate target of insults and obscenities. They were peltered with a barrage of bricks, chunks of concrete, blocks of wood with embedded nails and razor blades, and plastic bags filled with excrement. Over 60 National Guardsmen and local police were injured. The crowds were coordinated by leaders with walkie-talkies and armbands for identification. Many were not students, and several groups had previously been spotted arriving in cars with Illinois license plates. On numerous occasions, the organizers linked arms with each other, and forming a human chain behind the students, pushed them directly toward the National Guard, shouting, move on in, move on in. The planned revolution came to a climax at 12.30 p.m. on May 4th. 74 guardsmen found themselves in danger of becoming surrounded by angry demonstrators. Under a barrage of rocks and obscenities, the guardsmen retreated up a small hill toward Taylor Hall. Suddenly, a shot rang out from among the advancing crowd, a fact that later was confirmed by the testimony of students on the scene at the time and also by an examination of a bullet hole in a metal structure between the position of the crowd and the National Guard. The direction of the fragmented edges of the hole shows that the shot was fired from the crowd. The guardsmen were not professional soldiers. They had been on duty for four days and were under emotional strain. Upon hearing a shot from the hostile demonstrators, their reaction was predictable. They closed ranks, faced the crowd, and fired. In the melee that followed, ten students were wounded and four were killed. The victims were not leaders of the confrontation, 
but they became martyrs for the movement. Their tragic death was used and still is being used today as evidence of the repressive nature of the United States government. While the nation mourned, the revolutionaries were jubilant. And a few days later, on May 7th, Jerry Rubin said, It was the most significant day of all of our lives because in 48 hours, more young people were radicalized, revolutionized, and yippieized than in any single time in American history. Here then is the third benefit of terrorism in the form of not the action itself, but the reaction of the public. Terrorism eventually forces the government to take drastic measures which the public finds distasteful. Calculated provocation on the part of the revolutionaries leads inevitably to disastrous events and martyrs for the cause. Revolutionary propagandists present these as evidence that the government is repressive. The major part of the population may still reject the position of the revolutionaries, but many now will begin to view their own government as no better than the terrorists themselves, and still others will go further and join forces with the revolutionaries to combat the apparent injustices. This is a huge step forward in the development of a domestic revolution because it isolates the government from the moral support of its own people and sets the stage for the final conflict which will be fought by relatively small numbers while the vast majority must be counted on to remain neutral. Now, we have spoken so far only about terrorism from the left, the Marxist-Leninists who dream of socialism and communism. Let's turn our attention next to terrorism supposedly from the right, from those who at least claim that they are communism's foes. In Italy on August 2nd, 1980, a terrorist bomb explodes in the Bologna Railroad Station. 80 people are killed and 200 injured. Weeks later at the West German Oktoberfest in Munich, another bomb explodes, killing 12 and also injuring 200. Both of these actions are the work of fascist and neo-Nazi terrorists. In some countries like Italy, the number of casualties from these groups is almost as large as from the left. Their actual membership, however, is quite small, and they are splintered into competing factions. They have no central directorship, no schools for training their cadre, and no strategy for revolution. Their terrorism is limited mainly to acts of massive destruction, simply to embarrass or kill their enemies. The damage they do, however, can be extremely helpful in destabilizing a government. If that government also happens to be the target of the Soviet Union, then terrorism from these groups actually can serve many of the same purposes as terrorism from the left. This is the reason that the International Terrorist Network owned and operated by the Soviets, encourages violence against target governments from any group, provided only that they are not serious contenders for the seizure and holding of power. It's not surprising, therefore, that members of fanatical fascist groups have been received with open arms at the terrorist training centers in Libya. Gaddafi has offered assistance to terrorists on both sides in the Irish Civil War. And members of the neo-Nazi group that bombed the Munich Oktoberfest were actually trained at PLO camps in Lebanon. In Vietnam, many villages are burned to the ground by the Viet Cong in retaliation for non-cooperation. In El Salvador, a small town near Opico is destroyed by terrorists because the peasants refuse to support the revolution. In a small village in Rhodesia, the inhabitants are herded into a stone roundhouse belonging to the village chief and then burned alive. Their crime also was refusal to accept leadership offered by the revolutionaries. In another Rhodesian village, a tribesman is seized by Mugabe's terrorists who cut off his lips, ears, and fingers and then force his wife to eat them. <laughs> 
In Algeria, the FLN warns the Muslim population not to work for the government and not even to go into cafes or theaters. Those who ignore these orders are hideously...